Thank you so much, and, and thanks to Monica and the University of Michigan. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, I wanted to share with you some of the ways in which I see the practice and purpose of design evolving over the years ahead. My career spent mostly in the digital realm, um, and my perspective has definitely been shaped by that fact. Um, but I think some of the themes that I'm going to raise today about what we will design, how we will design it, and who will be doing the designing have lessons for disciplines across the design landscape. And it's a testament to the, <laughs> the great lineup that Monica brought together, because I've already heard so many similarities, you know, as different as digital design is to landscape architecture, product design architecture. I think you'll see some really interesting themes um, and similarities. So historically, designers have been assessed by whether they could imagine and produce effective, meaningful, beautiful experiences for people. And the goal has traditionally been to kind of conceive of the experience you're designing from end to end. In essence, to close the loop on the design. In order to do this, we've relied on our instincts, training, experience, our good taste. These things have allowed us to make well-informed assumptions. And well-informed assumptions are good. Uh, in my practice, you know, user experience research is critical to user experience design. It keeps us from designing for ourselves and instead uh, focuses us on the experience and the needs and wants of others. Uh, these are good and valuable methods. But if you want to be a part of the design of the future, you need to let go of designing for closed systems and embrace open systems. Now, closed system is a design that prescribes how the resulting product will be used end to end. It's like a Rubik's Cube. Now, a Rubik's Cube is fun for a while, but it can only do one thing. And usually, its shelf life is pretty short. I'm sure anybody who grew up in the 80s probably has a Rubik's Cube in a box packed away <laughs> somewhere. And once you solve it, the motivation to do it again kind of diminishes. Now, an open system provides people with a platform that doesn't try to dictate the outcome or even the purpose of the use. Now, we've known that this has been true since we were kids. Uh, somehow, we forget it as we grow up. We forget all the good stuff as we grow up, actually, is what I've realized the older that I get. Um, it's like comparing a Rubik's Cube to a set of wooden blocks or Play-Doh or a simple rag doll that doesn't have a face. The open-ended toys are the ones that have the longest lifespan. And they tell children, I believe in you, your ideas, your needs, and I'm in service of those things. Make of me what you will, because you know more what you need than I do. And these things, they can be used to imagine all kinds of things. As designers in the future, we'll write the book, but we'll knowingly leave the final chapter unfinished. We'll let the final chapter of, I wonder how this thing is going to be used to kind of play itself out in the marketplace. And, and while open systems can seem risky, they also produce phenomenal transformations in the way that people relate to communication, to technology, and each other. Many of the high-impact designs of the digital age didn't end up getting used the way that their inventors envisioned because they were left open for the community to absorb, iterate, and to redefine. Google started as a project not about search, but about annotating the web. Twitter started as a service for bike messengers. Um, and you know, these inventors kind of put their concepts out there, and, and the products took unexpected turns. And to their credit, they adapted and they learned from people. They didn't cling to their brilliant vision about what their thing was going to become. In the future, in addition to adapting to unexpected uses, we'll actually knowingly design open platforms that people can take in new and unforeseen directions. And companies are already starting to engage in this right now. Apple, a company famously protective of its brand and user experience, is allowing third-party developers to create their own apps and sell them through the Apple App Store. Now, of course, they need to be approved before launch, so Mr. Jobs hasn't completely drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, but longtime followers of his brand and UX management will agree that this is astonishing and, for me, really inspiring. It also happens to be enormously profitable for ap both Apple and the developers who are developing these applications. The concept of open systems may be scary, but if Steve Jobs can do it, all of you can too. 
By designing open systems, we can capitalize on the creativity and ingenuity of millions of people and won't rely solely on the training and instincts of a few. We can remove barriers to entry, fuel small business growth and prosperity and much across a much broader and diverse segment of the human population. It's like buying a million lottery tickets instead of just one. Your chances of winning get better and better. In the future, open systems will continue to fuel great innovations in design and uses for technological breakthroughs. Now, the idea of open systems is something else it, it, related to this, is something that I believe in the future of design, that we have to focus less on scarcity and elite access and more on abundance and ubiquity of access. We have to act less like elephants and more like frogs. Now, years ago, I read this really fascinating book when I was pregnant with my son, who is now 10 years old. It was called The Natural History of Parenting. And it explained all the different models by which the creatures of the natural world go about propagating their species and the relationship they have, if any, to their offspring. Now, how does this relate to the future of your design, you may ask? Well, in our common model, we much more often appreciate, approach ideation like elephants. We only produce a few cherished offspring, and we invest enormous amounts of time and energy and capital to ensure that they reach adulthood exactly as we want them to. We pre-select who should have access to the tools and mass audience, and assume that only a select few have voices that are worthy of being heard. That's the way that media has traditionally worked. Movies, books, news coverage. It's hard to get an audience if you're not a part of the elite. Access is scarce, and there are only a few voices. Now, frogs, on the other hand, are, by human standards, deadbeat moms and dads. They expend a ton of energy well, I mean, let's be clear. The females expend a ton of energy <laughs> laying a lot of eggs and then finding a safe place to store them. And then they let fate take over. Now, many eggs don't end up as frogs, but a few, and the right number by the math of nature, survive and flourish. Now, this is a useful metaphor for the current explosion in access to personal expression and communication tools. Blogs, Twitter, YouTube, and the like are all examples of open systems that break open access to media and distribution like never before. We don't know exactly what people will do with these tools, and we don't know who will produce something extraordinary. In the future, we'll be more like frogs and less like elephants. Because while opening up the floodgates to personal expression and communication tools creates a flood of potential noise, it also creates the most diverse set of faces and voices we've ever seen and heard in human history. The breakdown of the hierarchy of communication and how stuff is made means that there are many different people, and different types of people, participating in the marketplace of ideas and describing the human experience. Now, why is this important? Well, there's two reasons. Because the more widespread these systems become, the more fluent a broad swath of humanity becomes in telling their own stories. And it allows people across the globe to witness and interact the true diversity of humans in a way that we've never been able to do in the past. And it allows a world where everyday people with talent, but no connections or budget or any context in the power structure can rise to the top. It's a media meritocracy. But there's another reason. Even though most of these folks using these tools day to day to inform the world of their most mundane aspects of their lives, like what I had for lunch, the bus is late, occasionally something happens that turns someone ordinary on an ordinary day into something extraordinary. Now, we saw this happen recently with the protests in Iran. One day, people were using their mobile phones for everyday things maybe capturing a video of day-to-day -day events, sharing them with friends and family. But the next day, a protest broke out. And every day, people caught it on video and shared it with the world. Now, these weren't professional political bloggers who created these videos. These were regular people who had become fluent in digital communication tools, even though they lived in a place that doesn't support free speech. And when things broke down, they had the tools they needed, the access to an audience, and the confidence that their story mattered and it would be heard. 
they were uniquely poised to do what CNN could not. And this chorus of voices is no longer filtered by governments, traditional media, or corporations. In the future, if you're unhappy with the service a company gives you, you don't torture yourself with one of those awful telephone directory systems to talk to somebody. You go on Twitter and you tell all of your followers. <laughs> now, smart corporations are already listening and responding directly. The single human voice has been amplified. And this is democratic process in action. It's the triumph of the individual over the majority. An abundance of voices and ubiquitous access to tools will lead to greater self-determination, political change, economic development, and knowledge sharing on a scale that we have never seen before. From the masses emerge the magnificent, and the ordinary can become extraordinary on the turn of a dime. So what does this mean in terms of the kind of works, work that designers should focus on moving forward? As an industry, we've done a pretty good job of serving the top section of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, for those of you not familiar, I'll give you a very simplified explanation. Maslow explained that human needs could be described as the levels of a pyramid. And working from the bottom up, you move from needs of safety and security all the way up to comfort and what he called self-actualization. The key is humans have a very hard time addressing their needs at the top of the pyramid if their needs at the bottom haven't been met. In the future, we must and will spend significantly more time using our abilities and methods as designers to address the bottom part of the pyramid. In fact, as individuals and as an industry, we have a moral obligation to do so. We need to adopt a greater focus on service. We have to address the highly complex and very unsexy issues related to reinventing government, health care, education systems, address issues of water shortage and environmental destruction, and design programs and systems to end poverty. Design can and will make a difference in these areas. After all, the vast majority of the world are stuck at the bottom of the pyramid. In the future, we'll see a much larger percentage of designers' time focused on these areas where humankind most needs it. There are already firms and designers doing great work in these areas, and we've heard some about some of it today. Architecture for Humanity, building sustainable housing, often in the wake of natural disasters. The Design Council in the UK, helping citizens help each other manage their chronic illnesses. But these still feel like exceptions in our industry. Where is our design Peace Corps? Our no Nobel, design, or Nobel Prize for Design? Our designer's Hippocratic Oath? Where are the designer's roles in public schools, hospitals, and government? We can do better and we will do more. Behold the designer. Now, can anybody tell me how you can tell this is a designer? It's his fancy eyeglasses. <laughs> There's one thing I can assuredly tell you about the future of design, and it's that designers will wear and continue to wear awesome eyeglasses. And in fact, I've sometimes wondered whether my 2020 vision has held back my career, but that's not the topic of today. In the future as designers, we'll need to let go of control of the outcome. Now, this is a scary prospect for many designers. You know, our training you know, causes this uh, uh, focus on craft and quality of the outcome. It's what we value and how we measure success. But we could have a much larger impact on society if we were to start thinking about our role in a different way. We're designers. We're not angels. We're not devils either. We're people who were blessed with the ability to think out, think out of both sides of our brains. And you can thank genetics for that or a higher power if that's your belief. But at the end of the day, as JFK said, to whom much is given, much is required. And what is required in the future is that we go open source. We must not keep our methods and our practices to ourselves. We must invite others in and teach them to solve their own problems and explore opportunities. We must teach people to fish and not assume that we have to fish for them. We have to let go of the notion of the designer as the producer of fine things and adopt a new vision of the designer as a facilitator of people solving problems big and small. And the others in this future won't just be businesses. They may be school children or members of a church congregation or patients in a hospital or workers at a government agency. Most importantly, in the future, there will no longer simply be the consumer. That term speaks to an antiquated, unempowered view of people. 
Sometimes design acts as though people are in service of design, or worse, enslaved by technology. No, in the future, people won't just consume. They will produce, and they'll design too. I believe in order to take full advantage of the power and potential of design and technology to improve people's lives, you have to be an optimist, and you have to believe that man is inherently good. You have to believe that each individual deserves the right to speak his or her mind, have his or her story told, and not be encumbered by bureaucracy or power structures. If you don't believe that, then you're going to have a really hard time in the future. When I look at how people are banging our heads, uh, are, we're collectively banging our heads against the wall on issues related to crises in healthcare and education and poverty, I'm reminded of Albert Einstein's definition of insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. We must not do things the same way in the future. In the future, we must put people at the center of the process and not just let them validate it. Or in, but we really need to invite them in to co-design with us, to teach them our methods and crafts so that they can in turn bring design thinking and tools to their own challenges and opportunities and feel a deep sense of investment and ownership in what solutions emerge. We must design open systems that harness the ingenuity of many people. We have to break down barriers of access to tools of self-expression and communication. And we must be service-minded and solve the problems at the bottom of the pyramid to help lift people up. And we must reimagine ourselves in our role as designer, our relationship to our work, and the people we work in service of. Because in the future, it won't be about technology, and it won't be about designers. It'll be about people, and giving people the tools, and in doing so, giving them a voice. Thank you. <laughs>